Hey everybody, Freddie Servin. Thanks for hanging out in this week's Bible study. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 1. And we are going to take a large chunk this week because I think that it's all too good to split up into pieces. So, Acts chapter 10, we're going to look at verses 1 through 33. And this is God's first gospel footprints into the Gentile world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 33. I'm going to start by reading the passage for us. You follow along as I read. It says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius a centurion in which was known as the Italian cohort. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about, the th at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him with fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like, a large sheep being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The, vo the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon was known as, known as Peter was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied. We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. And a holy angel told him, to have you come to his house so that he could hear a message from you. Then Peter invited the men to the house to be his guest. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him, and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or even visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So I was sent for. I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? 
Cornelius answered, Four days ago I was in my house praying at this hour, and at three in the afternoon suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send a Joppa for Simon who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Some people view God's involvement in creation something like a watchmaker who made a watch and wound it up and sat it down to let it run on its own. Some people view creation and God's relationship to creation that way. God might have been hands-on at some time at the beginning of creation, but now he's hands-off. He's letting things just work itself out in creation on their own, in their own way. Well, we know better than that concerning God and his involvement in creation. God is no less involved today than when he was powerfully speaking it into existence by his word. We know better than that. We know today his son is upholding all things by the power of his word. In him all things hold together atoms and molecules and, and even universes. There is no room for a watchmaker thinking about God and his involvement in creation. But what I have been questioning in my own heart and way of thinking is whether or not I have a watchmaker thinking about God and his involvement in his son's gospel mission. If we've been seeing anything in the book of Acts in the early pages, it's that God was very, very much involved. He was intimately involved. He was powerfully involved in the advancement of the gospel all the way in the city of Jerusalem and beyond Jerusalem, into Judea, Samaria, Samaria, and even into Galilee. And we just read, and, and we'll soon see even more, just how intimately and powerfully involved he is in extending the gospel mission into the Gentile world. These are the early days of the gospel mission on these pages, and God is everywhere throughout it. He's under it. He's over it. He's in front of it. He's behind it. He's alongside of it. He's everywhere. So, where is he today? Have I begun to live have you begun to live as if he wound up the gospel mission in the early days, but now 2,000 years later, he's just letting it run on its own? Was he hands-on in the beginning, but now he's hands-off? Is he just letting the gospel mission go on its own? Or by our own in ingenuity? Well, I hope we know better than that. Concerning God and his gospel mission, today let's remind ourselves of what we know to be true. What we know to be true as we continue to watch God's early involvement in the extending gospel mission from a very 
Jewish region into a very Gentile region. There is no room for a watchmaker way of thinking about God in regards to the involvement of his son's gospel mission. So let's trace his hand. Let's trace his fingerprints. Let's watch the footsteps of his undeniable work in the early pages of the gospel mission. And you know what? That's good enough right there. Just to stop and worship him. He is in control of the gospel mission. It will succeed. We could see it from the earliest days. He loves his son's gospel mission more than Peter does. He loves it more than all of us put together. So let's just worshipfully marvel at his undeniable presence as the gospel is preached from one city to another, from one soul to another. Let's allow Acts 10 to motivate us to trace back his fingerprints and footsteps even in our own coming to Christ. How was it that I ever became convicted of my sin? It was God. It was God. He was closer than I ever knew. How was it that you were just in the right place at just the right time to hear the gospel when you did? How was it that you grew up in the family that you grew up in and heard the gospel those many years and you came to faith in Christ? How did that happen? You didn't determine that. God did. He was closer than you ever knew. How was it that you were willing, Christian, to turn from your sin that you loved and would not give up? God's fingerprints were all over your radical change and deep change of mind. And how was it, Christian, that you found Jesus to be so appealing to you. How? It was God. That's how. God has never been a spectator. God has never been a watchmaker watching how the gospel was running apart from him. He's not in the cheap seats. He's not in the box seats. He's actually on the fields making the plays. So let's go back to the early days of the gospel mission as it was expanding just like Jesus said it would. To a very Jewish-centered world, to a very Gentile-filled world. Four steps this week. Four steps that God alone took to extend the gospel mission into the Gentile world. That's what this passage is all about. And number one, the first step, it's an angel's vision for Cornelius, verses 1 through 8. In verses 1, God's first step begins in a home of an of a Italian soldier stationed in Caesarea. Caesarea was a city of great importance and, and renown. It was a capital city of the Roman providence of Judea. And Cornelius, it says, in verse 1, was a centurion of why and what was known, excuse me, of the Italian cohort. These cohorts of soldiers were made up of volunteers. These Italians were not drafted. They were not slaves, forced to become soldiers. These were volunteers, men of usual character. They wanted to do this and serve. 
there are more than 32 of these Italian cohorts spread throughout the Roman Empire, and Cornelius is not just a member of them. It says he's a centurion over one. This means he had a hundred of these men under his care in Caesarea. These Italian cohorts were considered to be the most faithful and loyal troops in all of the Roman Empire. They were not reckless devils or martyrs just looking to kill recklessly, but instead they were steady, determined, convinced, unmovable leaders who would stand their ground no matter what. They would die defending the cause that they were to defend, and that's how Cornelius is described in verse 1. On a completely different level in verse 2, notice how he is described. It says he is a devout man. That word means he's godly. And the New Testament does not throw that term around carelessly or casually. This brave Italian soldier was a godly man according to all the right standards. And also, it says in verse 2, he was a man that feared God. This means he was a Gentile who came to believe that the God of the Jews was the only God to worship. Now, he did not go all the way and become a Jew. He did not submit himself to circumcision. He's called a God-fearer, and so also was all of his house. He feared God with all of his household. That means his family, down to his servants, his family had been impacted. impacted. His household had been impacted by his worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. And it says in verse 2, he gave alms to the Jewish people. That means he was a charitable man. He was generous. He gave to the Jewish people gifts, money, food, whatever it was that they needed. He was moved by mercy. Mercy that he had for the Jewish people. The Jews were not people held in high esteem at that time throughout the Roman Empire. So, for a Roman citizen to give and to attach himself to them, let alone give them gifts that would help them out, and for it to be an Italian soldier who did this would have been shocking. And verse 2 it says, Cornelius prayed to God continually. He was a beggar, begging God continually. And it was such at this time in verse 3, he was praying at 3 in the afternoon. 3 p.m. in the afternoon. It's the evening sacrifice. In the midst of that prayer, that's when heaven, when God sent him a visitor, it says in verse 3 that an angel of God had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. Verse 4, Cornelius was startled. It, he stared at him in fear. It says that he was very much alarmed. A brave Italian soldier, one who had risen above all the others, with enough guts and courage and confidence to be able to command a hundred of these other brave soldiers is alarmed. It's because he is facing a figure with greater awe and power than he ever met on any battlefield. And so with humility, he says, what is it, Lord? And what will this mighty one say who has caused his soldier to tremble? 
it's really shocking what he says. He says, your prayers and, and your alms or gifts have ascended as a memorial before God. That means they're pleasing to God. There's a genuine Old Testament Gentile believer in Yahweh. His worship is accepted by Yahweh. But Messiah has come, and Messiah has suffered, and Messiah has been raised from the dead, and Messiah has ascended to the right hand of his Father, and he is conducting his gospel mission on earth until his kingdom comes. And offering a pardon to all who will believe. And Messiah's name is Jesus. A man from Nazareth. And Cornelius does not know him. Cornelius' genuine Old Testament worship of Yahweh. It anticipated the one coming. But now Cornelius' worship must transition from Messiah anticipating to Messiah knowing. And Messiah loving. And Messiah dying. And Messiah obeying. That's really what this passage is all about. And how is it going to come about verses 5 and 6? This heavenly being has directed for him. It says... In verse 5, now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner who is houses by the sea. So this heavenly being has directions for Cornelius. So Cornelius did not hesitate, verses 7, when the angel spoke to him and had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. The devout soldier is called the same thing Cornelius was called. He's a godly man. So he had a personal attendant who was a soldier who was a godly man like Cornelius was. Three Gentiles from his household will go to Joppa to get Peter, verses 8, after he explained everything to him, he had sent them off. He explained everything to them so that they would understand perfectly just what it was they were supposed to do. So that's so that there was no hesitation, no mix-up in any of the mission. Why? Why do it this way? Why is God going through an angel through this whole process? Why didn't the angel just preach the gospel to Cornelius? So that he could hear the mission and hear that Messiah is actually Jesus, a man from Nazareth. Why didn't he just do it that way? Or why didn't he just send Cornelius on a trip over to where Peter was? So he could hear about Jesus of Nazareth. I mean... He could have been doing it that way and it would have been faster. Here's why God's gospel mission must come from the Jew to the Gentiles. And God is concerned about that pattern. It, it matters to him. Acts 1.8, you will receive my spirit and, and you'll receive my power. It will come on to you and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria that's a very Jewish region. And even to the ends of the earth, that's where all the Gentiles are. That's the pattern established. To the Jew first, then to the Greek. And in the Old Testament, the mission pattern was just the opposite. The Gentiles came from the ends of the earth to where class? To Israel. To worship Yahweh. This mission is different. It starts from a very Jewish place and runs outward. So the Jewish followers of Jesus were followers of Peter 
and traveled to the Gentiles' home to preach the gospel to them. That's one of the reasons why the angel couldn't preach the gospel to him and why Cornelius could not go to Peter. This pattern matters to God, and he established it for Cornelius to see and for Peter to see, for all to see. And why even this? Why even include Cornelius? Why not get Peter ready and just have Peter go? Why does Cornelius have to be ready for this? I wonder if it wouldn't help Peter. Could you think how this could help Peter? A Gentile wants me. A Gentile is sending for me. So God visited me, a Gentile, and summoned me to the Gentile's house. An angel visited a Gentile. I would never go visit a Gentile, Peter might say. That would help knock down any Jewish elitism that Peter might have. And so here, we have God taking the very first step through an angel from heaven to direct the Gentile to summon Peter. God alone took that first step. This is not Cornelius. This is not his idea. And the second step God took to the gospel mission to the Gentile world was number two, the Spirit's vision for Peter, verses 9 through 23. The Gentiles had to be prepared, and now the Jew had to be prepared, verses 9. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Joppa was 30 miles from Caesarea, and while the three Gentiles are traveling, the Holy Spirit is prepping the Jew Peter. The three men must have traveled most of the night to arrive there by noon. The next day, lunchtime, Peter's lunch was delayed and it just happened to coincide with the noontime prayer and it just happened to coincide with the arrival of these three Gentiles looking for him. Verse 10, he had become hungry and wanted something to eat and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. This means that his mind and his senses were lifted up out of the natural surroundings in order to see what was coming next. Verse 11, it says he saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. Literally, it's heaven. Heaven was open. Heaven was open. This is not earthly oriented. It's not an earthly oriented idea or thought. It's not an earthly centered revelation. Nobody on earth thought of this. Heaven thought about this and opened itself up and let it come down. Heaven invaded Peter's world so Peter would get what it was that God is up to on the gospel mission. Verses 12, it says, It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. It's like a sheet that's loaded with a mix of all kinds of animals. They're not segregated off nicely or neatly. Um, they're not cleaned one over the other. It's a big uh, accumulation of animals that, that that's the vision from heaven. But wait, there's audio from heaven as well. Verse 13, it says... Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, and kill. Commands from heaven, kill and eat. Kill and eat from the mixture of animals. Pick one. <laughs> Verses 14, Peter says, surely not, Lord. Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. Peter would have been thinking, what? 
in the heaven is going on. Keep your hand in Acts 10, but go to Leviticus chapter 20. That's right. Go back to Leviticus chapter 20. You remember those, you know, you remember that book, those, you know, crispy white pages. Let's dirty them up a little bit today. Leviticus chapter 20, look at verses 24. Here is what's guiding Peter's thinking. This is what guided his whole life up until this moment. God said to the people of Israel in Levitical law, verses 24, it says, But I said to you, you will possess their land. I will give it to you as an inheritance. A land flowed with milk and honey. I am your Lord God who set you apart from nations. You must therefore make a distinction between clean and unclean animals and between unclean and clean birds. Do not defile yourself by any animal or bird or anything that moves along the ground, those which I have set apart as unclean for you. I'm your God and I'm going to set you apart. And here's how I'm going to set you apart from the rest of the people. Just like we read in verse 25. Look, this is just one of the ways God wanted to make Israel set apart from the nations. There's nothing fancy or secret about some animals being clean or unclean. God just determined what the clean and unclean animals are and to follow my rules that will make you look different. So be holy to me. And it says in verse 26, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I've set you apart from nations to be my own. This is what every Jew was brought up in. And that is what Peter is saying. I have never eaten anything unclean. But Peter doesn't offer a mild protest. One commentator said it translated would be, Goodness, Lord, don't ask me to do that. But God makes the vision crystal clear in Acts 10 and verses 15. He says, The voice spoke to him a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now, Peter is only thinking about food at this point. He's hungry and lunch is late. He knows nothing about three Gentiles on their way to invite him into another Gentile's home in Caesarea. And this happened, verse 16, three times. And immediately the object was taken back up into heaven. This was a radical step that God was taking. God is going against what he earlier commanded the Jews. God is making clear that this is from heaven. God is making clear that a God-initiated change has come. How did Peter handle this? Verse 17, he said, While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. And while he was perplexed and stunned trying to figure out what the vision was about, these three men were already in the city asking for him. And they are arriving at the gate. And it says in verse 18, they called out at the gate. Peter is likely on the roof. Maybe there's a canopy top over him. He's probably, you can't see him. He's, you certainly can't hear him. And they're asking if Simon, who is called Peter, is at this house. Verse 19, what was Peter still doing? He was reflecting on the vision. And that is when the Spirit is identifying and is speaking to him. The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Get up, go downstairs without hesitation and go with them for I have sent them. So the Holy Spirit says, I send three Gentile men to you. 
Kind of like I just sent you three sights from heaven coming down. Three sheets coming down. All kinds of uncleanness in there. I send three men to you and command you to go down and accompany them. Go with them without any misgivings. Does Peter make any headway in his understanding at this point? I think he does. Look at verse 21. It says, Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come for Cornelius. He is a righteous and God-fearing man and is respected by all the Jewish people. So Peter went right down there and said to them, I'm the one you're calling for. The three men, knowing Peter is going to have an obstacle in his mind about visiting a Gentile, they do everything possible they can to clear out the obstructions by saying, we were sent by Cornelius. He is righteous and a God-fearing man is respected by all the Jewish people. So you have nothing to fear, Peter. He's a righteous man. He's a God-fearing man. He's well-spoken of. Nothing to fear, Peter. And he was directed, he was commanded by the Holy Spirit to send you to his house to hear a message from you. Well, how could Peter resist that? Did Peter begin to get what was going on? I think he does absolutely. Look at verse 23. Don't read past verse 23 too quickly when he says, Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guest. This was his initiation. It is not his house. It's Simon the Tanner's house. But he took the initiative. And he invited them in. And more than that, Peter is ready to travel with them to go to Cornelius' house. Look at verse 23. The next day, Peter started out with them and, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. An entire household of Gentiles, they're going to see. Now, it says that there are some other Jewish believers in Messiah there, and they came along to see what on earth and in heaven is going on. Now, you don't read anything in verses 9 through 23 and think, you know what? Peter's a progressive thinker. Peter is on the cutting edge of missionary ideas. You don't think that at all anywhere. The only one who was on the cutting edge was the God of heaven who was powerfully at work preparing a Gentile and is now preparing a Jew. An entire household of Gentiles waiting to hear from a Jewish follower of Messiah Jesus. Those two parties have come together to meet. One message comes throughout loud and clear. And the message is, is that God is in control. God is. God is in control. He is transitioning the gospel mission from Jewish territory into the Gentile world. The third step that God took alone was related to the second. It's an expansion of the second. It's, a, it's the persuasion Peter has come a long way since verse 23, but just how far has he come? How persuasive was God for Peter? Well, you get to see that through Peter's own words. Look at verse 24. It says, The following day he arrived at Caesarea. Cornelius, Cornelius was expecting them, and he called together his relatives and close friends. Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. So Peter made him get up and he said, Stand up, for I am only a man myself. So 
What has Cornelius been up to? He must have planned. He must have timed it. He, trying to time it in such a way that all his friends and relatives would arrive at the time when Peter would be, be coming. So the house is full of Gentiles and they're waiting for a Jew. Can you just appreciate that? We are so far from that. So far removed. We read that and it doesn't mean anything to us. But this is why we need to get into the context. You got to get into their days. This was shocking. This was not going on anywhere else in the Roman Empire. Why did it? What did it take for this to happen? Well, that's easy. An angel of the Lord and the Holy Spirit, that's what it took. Working through visions. What did Peter experience when he walked in? He's walking in. I know he's a centurion. He probably knows now he's an Italian. He's one of those guys. He runs a whole Italian cohort. I'm going to that guy. He walks into his house in verse 25. It says, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence again. But Peter made him get up and he said, stand up for I am a man myself. Surprise. Wasn't expecting that one. Peter probably thought that. An Italian warrior laying at a fisherman's feet, a follower of Jesus. Quickly, Peter helped him. Verse 26. Stand up. And he said, I am only a man myself. And in verse 27, Luke's language here is great. It says that they're walking and they're talking as they're making their way into the house. And it says that Peter found a large gathering of people. Many people assembled. The second shock of his day, a centurion laying down before him to try to worship him. Second shock, a whole household of people of Gentiles. And Peter knew, verse 28, that this was a situation that needed explanation. He stated what he knew that they knew as Gentiles. Look at the emphasis, verse 28. It says, He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with the Gentile, or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. Wow. Look at the emphasis there. He's saying, you know, Gentile, that this is against my law for me. You know it. For a Jew to associate with the foreigner, let alone to go visit them, this is something forbidden and you know it. So what is Peter doing here? Verse 28, God has shown me. It says, God, he, Peter says, God has shown me. That I should not call any man impure or unclean. Do you think that Peter is persuaded by God at this point? I think so. Peter and the Gentiles all knew that God commanded through the Old Testament scriptures to live a separate life from the Gentiles around them. They all knew this. They were aware of that. Don't intermarry with them. Their daughters will lead your sons from Yahweh. They all knew this. Peter says they all knew it. And yet here they are under the same roof because God has brought a significant change. Listen to this. Jewish followers of Messiah, Jesus, are not to apply those separation laws from Israel to the gospel mission of the church. That's what God said. We sep what separated the Jews from the Gentiles is not to separate the Christians from the Gentiles on the gospel mission. 
Do you understand that? That's a huge fundamental shift. The gospel mission for the church is not to be constricted by separation laws for Israel. God made that clear to Peter. Now, why has this ended? Because Messiah Jesus has come. It has to end. How clear was this to Peter? Verse 29. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objections. May I ask why you have sent me? Peter doesn't claim to have all the dots connected all by himself. God made it clear to him. Peter's intuition, Peter's progressive thinking wasn't even involved. His ingenuity wasn't even involved. God alone worked and persuaded Peter without a shadow of a doubt to be there with the Gentiles. The last step that God alone took to arrange this, number four, God's congregation of the Gentiles. This is God's congregation of Gentiles in verse 30. Cornelius's explanation of why they're all sitting there four days ago to this hour, that's when an angel visited Cornelius. And it says, I was in my house praying at this hour. At three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers and remembered your alms to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. Could you imagine this? I mean, could you put yourself in Cornelius' shoes? Could you imagine an angel coming into your presence and saying, your worship of Yahweh is pleasing what a huge encouragement for a Gentile to hear that it's pleasing. All Cornelius knew was he was supposed to do was to go send for a man named Simon Peter in Joppa. Verse 32, it says, Send to Joppa for Simon who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner who lives by the sea. And can you imagine Peter? Peter's thinking, I was 30 miles away four days ago and an angel from heaven knew me and knew where I was staying and had this Gentile come get me. Cornelius obeyed and sent. Verse 33. So I sent for you immediately and it was good of you to come. And Peter obeyed and you have to have been kind enough to come, Peter. You've been kind enough to come. And so here we all are in a house full of Gentiles with a Jewish believer in Messiah Jesus. And who in this moment is Cornelius most aware of? Look down. Now, we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Cornelius knew this was all of God and not of man. Cornelius knew he didn't arrange this. And he knew Peter didn't arrange this. And what are these Gentiles presented for? Verse 33. To hear a message to hear all that you have commanded by the Lord. To hear all of it. Cornelius was interested. Cornelius was not interested in Peter's opinion. He was not interested in Peter's ideas. But like a soldier of God, Peter had been commanded by God to speak. It's a military term. The Lord commanded you to speak. I'm a soldier who receives commands from those over me, and I understand you are commanded to speak. So we are all here. We are here to hear everything. This is God's congregation for the right moment. Peter is ready. Why else is Peter ready? Well, it's because he has been fully persuaded 
by God, through that vision, by the Spirit, and what the Spirit gave him out of heaven. And Cornelius is as teachable as he is because of an angel's preparation. God's fingerprints are all over this account. And the gospel is going beyond Jewish territory into Gentile territory, clearly and obviously because God and his footprints and everything belong to God and his sovereignty. The first thought that comes to my mind as I read this for a Christian 2,000 years later is just to worship. Worship this God. Worship that he works like this. That he made his gospel intentions so abundantly clear. Worship him that he is in control of the expanding gospel mission from what was about 120 followers in an upper room in Jerusalem and now it's flooding over into Caesarea. The mission has gone just as his son declared it would go. Jerusalem was filled with the teachings of Jesus. Samaria, Judea, and Galilee was abundantly filled with the gospel and the church was everywhere. The apostles had to split up and travel throughout all parts of that region and know the stage has and now the stage has been set for all the Gentiles to hear the gospel and it's all because God directed the involvement. He didn't wind no watch up and set it down and watch it do its thing. But he is still intimately involved. I want to take you back and remind you of what I reminded you before. Christian, how was it that you ever became convicted of your sin? It was God. He was closer than you ever knew. How was it that you were just in the right family at the right time with the right person at the right time to hear the good news of Jesus Christ? Forgiveness of sins for his shed blood. How did that happen? It was God. He was so close. Christian, how was it that you were able to turn away from your sin that you loved? God. His fingerprints were all over the radical change of mind. How is it that you found Christ to be so desirable? God. He was very near. He wasn't a distant spectator. He was no watchmaker watching from a distance what you were doing apart from him. He was close enough to cause you to be born again. Do you remember that, Christian? He was close. And we sit all together online with the week out in front of us, the Christmas week out in front of us Jesus's birth what's true this week in regards to the gospel mission what's true is God a spectator is he off watching is he off running oh Christian step forward with faithfulness in the gospel mission knowing that he is intimately involved, he is powerfully involved, just like he was for your own conversion. How is it that that lost one that you know, how is he gonna, are she ever going to become convicted of his or her own sin? How? Well, God, yes. But you, being faithful, having courage, stepping where you know God is working. Trust God that he is still at work, bringing conviction of sin. And how will those that are lost ever hear about Jesus and forgiveness of sin through him? How are they going to hear 
if a preacher is not sent, how will that one of God and his kindness, how will they ever know and be led to repentance? Who is it going, who's going to be the one to be in that lost one's life at just the right moment? It's got to be you and it has to be me. With courage and faithfulness for what we've been called to be as witnesses of Jesus Christ. Step forward. Test God this week and next week. In the Christmas week. God, are you intimately involved? I'm going to take a step. I'm going to risk it all. I'm going to open my mouth. Are you there? Find out. Find out God is at work through his faithful servants. So, as we step forward into the Christmas week, let's close our time in prayer. And I just want to walk you through a couple of main points in our prayer. So pray with me here today. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this gift, Lord. This gift where we could congregate online and come together as the church under your word, being submitted to you. As we move forward in this week, the true Christmas story, the birth of your son, the birth of your son, and what have, been, what have been known in society in those days and in our days as being born in an unclean place, Lord. But what you have commanded is that whatever you call to be clean is clean. And so this week, Lord... May we not call any person impure. May we not call any person uncommon. May we be submitted to you. Going forth, being your witnesses, being the teachers and the preachers sent to tell the good message, Lord, to tell the good news of your son and why he came to Bring forgiveness through his shed blood and salvation, hope in this season. So thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, thank you guys um, again for being here and gathering this week, um, congregating and just submitting ourselves under the word of God. From our family um, here, we just want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas. Um, we'll see you very soon. Um, have an awesome week. And remember to go forward this week. Test God. Be faithful with the message, the only good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you guys. Have an awesome week. And I look forward to seeing you soon.